Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about an idea uh, I had um, in HP in the late 90s. And I've been waiting very patiently for a long time to be able to find a way of explaining this to people um, with to establish you know, the, the sufficient context is established that the concepts make sense. So I was doing this before REST, for example. Um, and REST came along, excellent. That's that's a you know people people are starting to understand the web, and then REST services wiped out SOA SOAP services, excellent, good progress. And now microservices, they're coming in, and that's increasing the granularity, excellent. It's it's all um, excellent progress. So we're we're moving from monolithic architecture increasingly through service architecture with a few missteps in terms of technologies, but more, more fine-grained systems, now to microservice architectures. And it's about increasing the amount of fine-grained organizational structure we have in our systems. Why is that a good thing? Why, why is it d worth doing? It's worth doing because you know, we know from things like Unix that if you build something that's self-contained and does a good job, what you can do is combine two things into something different, or something new, and the value of the two things is greater than the sum of the parts. The, great, the, the composite has, has additional value somehow. This isn't technology, this is just the real world. You know? If you laid the bus out that just went past the window there as its parts all over the ground, that's not a very useful thing, but you could do it. But the bus assembled as a composite is a useful thing. We can move around in it, do whatever we want. So this is a good thing. But there's still some very big challenges about the way we're doing it. And what I, what I hope at the end of this, you kind of sort of start to recognize, we're still talking about the service. We're still service oriented. That's kind of a bit of a codish kind of way of thinking about the problem. These are actually micro resources, and what we're building is composite resources. That's that's what we're, that's what our game is. The web is a resource-oriented system. So, what is a resource? So, this is a diagram I drew about 15 years ago. And if there's one, yeah, apart from that that little thing I said there, one thing to remember: this is it. This is. Um, the whole abstraction, and we're all actually completely familiar with this. When we want to interact with the web, we, an event happens. It could be we click on a link, or we could have an address bar, or we could increasingly have a piece of AJAX code, make a call uh, for a resource. But the contract we have with the web is we're not trying to run a piece of code. We're not trying to make this CPU warm by getting this endpoint to do whatever it's done. What we're trying to do when we interact with the web is we're trying to measure the state of this abstract thing that's got a name, this URL, this resource that we're trying to interact with. And essentially, we want to take a snapshot of its current state. We want, what's the current state of Google? What's the current state of the BBC News? Whatever it might be. So the objective of the web has never been about running code. It's not a code-oriented system. It's, it's a it's a resource-oriented system. So it's about interacting with a very large, semi-infinite set of logical resources, logical potential states. Now, my background is I'm actually, I got into software as a sort of secondary uh, career. I was originally a, a physicist, uh, did quantum mechanics. So I looked at the web back in the day, and I went, oh, yeah, it's just like a Hilbert state space. What we're essentially doing is this is a potential set. There's a wave function for all the potential states of the web. And what we're doing is when we make a request into it, we collapse it down into a state. It's exactly the same. So I was like, OK, I understand the web. Right, now we understand the web. Let's really use it. 
because the power of the web is not the abstraction. The, 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 the beautiful thing about the web is its economics. You know, it's, it's incredibly robust. It evolves without breaking. I, I started doing software with objects and the state of the art technologies, and I discovered that it didn't matter how clever you were or thought you were or how smart your team members were, the stuff of code, of object-oriented code or just code in general, is malleable at first when we start writing it, but becomes brittle over time as we want to and, and the inevitable thing is the world is going to come at you with some changes. That's why we, that's why we move to agile practices, because we're trying to evolve and adapt to change. But our code is still essentially like pouring liquid cement, but suddenly it becomes hard concrete. And it's quite hard to deal with it. So eventually you get to a point often in systems where you hit the wall of complexity where just the, the amount of change required isn't worth putting the effort in to change the code base to adapt it. So you throw the thing away and you build another one. Which is okay if it's a small thing, but if it's a big thing, it's a very big waste of effort, waste of resources. So if we could really use the web abstraction, the one thing we know for damn sure is we've never had to throw the web away. You know, show me another software system that has grown and grown was never anticipated for all the uses it's being used for, and it's essentially the same thing. As, as you know, you could point today's modern browser at an original Apache One server, and it would work. That's very unlike most software systems. So we love the web. The web's fantastic, but we really want to use it for solving this software problem. The problem with the web is. It's kind of, the problem of the web is its triumph. The, the triumph of the W3C is that they've um, cajoled and persuaded and ensured that all of the tools, all of the servers, all of the browsers and so on, treat the web as a uniform single address space. So when I look at the same resource as you, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, effectively, most of the time, unless we're in a filter bubble or whatever, we see the same state, the same resource. Now that's great if your model for the web is a big global publishing system, which is the original heritage of what the web was designed for. But we're now moving to non-publishing systems. We're building APIs, we're building um, services that do anything that the business wants to do with this, with this stuff. And having a flat address space is actually a huge problem because every endpoint you put into it is a peer of every other endpoint. So, you know, every microservice has to manage its own security. You have to deal with its scaling and all of the containerization and so on. Its availability, if other systems are building composites from it, what happens if it goes away? And then you've got the other question of these, you know, we know that REST encourages stateless architectures, stateless endpoints. We know stateless is great. But stateless means we've got no context. That's by design with the web. When we interact with a web endpoint, it's context-free, right? We have to transfer the representational state to provide the context in which we want to interact with the resource. But if you don't have context, you can't build trust. How do I know who you are? You've got to prove it to me every time you interact with me. It becomes very challenging. Now, what we do is we adopt all sorts of elaborate technical means of solving that problem, but it's a system problem. It's a fundamental system problem. And as we move to composites of microservices, the system problems just become more because now we have layers of services interacting with each other, but it's distributed. And you know, how do we debug them? How do we measure them? How, how are they performing? How do we find the bottlenecks? What happens if something fails and how do we find that failure and, and respond to it? And uh, so on and so on and so on. The big issue here is, in fact, HTTP, HTTP is fantastic, but HTTP came before the abstraction. HTTP isn't really a resource-oriented way of thinking about the stuff. This is why you get into angels on the heads of pins debates about, should I use a put, should I use a post? So what we did is we basically said, 
We love it. It's clearly an excellent way of solving a whole classes of problems. It scales, it evolves, doesn't hit the ceiling of complexity, seems to be able to cope with any type of problem you throw at it. Why aren't we using it for everything? Why don't we just make our software out of this stuff as well? But of course, you can't make it with HTTP. You can't, you know, you, the, the latencies would be too high, it just wouldn't work. You just, you've got to stop thinking of it as an HTTP thing. It's an abstraction, it's a resource oriented abstraction. So what you do is you go back to first principles and you say, what's the core essence of the abstraction? And then we bring that inside our software. So this is the general, we call it the resource oriented computing abstraction. It's not the web anymore. And you see that, broadly speaking, it's identical. The objective of a resource oriented system is not to run code. That's a secondary concern if we can't somehow get a state for that resource. If we have to run the code, then we fall back to running code. But one of the tricks the web pulls is, if you've already got a fair representation of that resource, then you can fetch it from cache, or you can fetch it from a CDN, or you can fetch it from anywhere. So we can use that same trick to get very powerful um, scaling properties inside software as well. Ultimately, the code inside that box is communicating with the code inside this box, but in fact what we're thinking about is this is a resource. I'm making a request for a resource. I need the state. I need a representation of the state of the resource. We don't have DNS anymore because this isn't the internet. This is just an arbitrary software abstraction. So how does an endpoint commit to own responsibility for a set of these abstract resources? What we've done is say, we can put a grammar in, in place into the software system and say, if your resource request matches the appropriate grammar, then you've essentially got a contract that says you're responsible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept responsibility for the representation of state of that resource if it should happen. And then there's one other thing you do, which is you say that big global address space, which is so powerful for publishing applications, we can have a single address space if that's what we want for our architecture, but why not have as many spaces as we want? Why not have context? Why not allow ourselves to have relationships between micro webs? So this isn't micro services, this is micro webs. And these things inside the micro webs are nano services, effectively. So that's the big idea. That's, that's what I started thinking about. And uh, as I said, it, it uh, took a while for REST to become a, a thing. And now microservices are a thing. And now hopefully this is something that makes sense. You, you can see what I'm talking about. This is, uh, this is what I would normally do, um, a demo, but I don't have time because we've got very short. So what I would normally do is make some requests into a single address space and show you how we can make resource requests inside software. And you just have to take it as read that we can make resource requests. Everything's addressed with URIs. We're talking about uniform resources, but we're not making web requests. We're making resource requests inside code. Turns out that you can improve and enhance the way that you think about the addressing as well once you start doing this, thinking about this approach. So HTTP and you, you know, the URL tends to be belie the, the heritage that the first system that we put on the web was mapping a directory of files from a Unix system, so the path is that way rather than that way. That's why we have path-like structures in URLs. When everything's a resource, what you really want to be able to do is say, this is powerful, because what I can do is I can make a, I can make a request that says, I want that to do something to that. So I can think about a different addressing model that allows me to make those type of resource requests. I want those resources to mix together, to do something to each other that gives me a new resource. That new resource is still a resource, so the identifier of the resource is the identifier of that, of that transformed resource. So what we did was we published something called the Active URI as an IETF spec in 2002, IETF draft. And as far as I know, no one's ever touched it. Uh, anyone's, no one's ever used it. We use it as our default 
identifying structure. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to do that to that type of request. It's, it's just a URI. So I can, do, I can do transformations of resources. I'm not going to do it because I haven't got time. What I really want to do is kind of shift perspective and say, OK, I've set up myself. Ron's taken the rotten fruit uh, initially about objects being having an inherent sort of limit of complexity. I've now got to prove that this approach somehow can get through that barrier of complexity. So that's what I want to try and do. So what we have is a very simple set of elemental pieces. We have micro webs containing nano services provided by endpoints, it's exactly the same as we do in the web. But we've lifted the constraint of saying, I only have one address space. Now we can have many. We can put things into appropriate partitions, appropriate units. So if that's, the, if that's all we've got to play with, endpoints and spaces and requests, how do we connect spaces together? Well, we come up with a very simple pattern. Pattern we've been doing since Unix. You can take the idea of mounting an address space where when you make a request for something here, it ends up going somewhere else, right? So that's how we do an import between spaces. It's an endpoint that should you ask for a resource, it goes, well, I don't know, but I'll go and ask for somewhere else that might know. That's what an import is. That's what a proxy server does in the web. But it's not really attempting to encapsulate and divide up and make, make the spaces granular in the web. It's acting more like a, a caching layer or whatever. But this is essentially a, a, a pattern you can use. So suddenly imports aren't like language declarations where you say, I want to link and bind this function into my code. They're active components, active resources that say the set of resources provided by this space are resolvable in this space. So you can start to build systems. And the, general, the, the most general pattern that emerges from these building blocks is you can say, I will have an endpoint that, should I make a request that resolves to it, will take that request and potentially route it into this another space. So it sounds like a little bit like the import, but in fact, it can transform that request, it can intercept the request, it can do whatever it wants. The key thing about this pattern, we call it the overlay pattern, is that this space inside is entirely encapsulated. In fact, it's owned by the overlay, which sounds it starts to seem a little bit like an object, right? So you can, you know, you can do encapsulation, but it's resource-oriented encapsulation, not object-oriented encapsulation. Right, scale. So this is my uh, development machine, and I'm going to show you one of my modules. And this is a live system. And what you see is, uh, it doesn't particularly matter what this architecture is. It's an HTTP front end stack. It's a stable architectural configuration. And it's composed of a set of spaces that have a relationship in an architecture. What I want to do is show you the 30,000 foot view of what my system is doing. So what I've got in my system at the moment is many, many, many of these micro web spaces. And those micro web spaces are organized into architectures. And those architectures are solving problems by coordinating nano services to solve the problem. And every single one of these things is not providing code is providing resolvable resources. So I don't know if you, uh, the microphone's working, but um, this is not physically coupled linked code. These diagrams, they look scary the first time you see them. Let me make it even more scary because I'm only showing you the front uh, facing stuff. If I merge the libraries that are common across all the systems, it gets even more scary, right? I'm now at a scale, so to give you a sense of scale, something like, you see those three there, or um, 
three, three or four spaces here. In software terms, in terms of equivalency, that's something like a three-tier spring thing. So that's, that's what that is a sort of equivalent to in terms of complexity. And I'm certainly now at one or two orders of magnitude higher complexity. The point about this is that this was done progressively, like the web. We didn't, no one knows what the architecture of the web is, right? No one has designed it. We don't know what the web it looks like. We can't. We know what little individual pieces of it look like. We can take responsibility for subsystems. We can put boundary conditions around them using constraints like the overlay. And that assembly will behave extremely well and correctly, even in this completely decoupled landscape of other stuff around it. I can't get crosstalk in my system. I can't break it when I add something new. You don't break Google when you add an endpoint to the web. This is the same. So this is not loosely coupled software. This is just like the web. The web is a decoupled architecture. It only couples the moment you make a request. The binding is instantaneous, and then it's decoupled. This is the same. This is potential architecture. This is potential ways my system is configured. If I make a request, it could potentially route through these ways. So all I've been showing you is these little building blocks. That's all it is. Everything is a micro resource. And suddenly, I can make resource requests that say, I want you to do this to that. So I can do everything you can do in code. I can do exactly the same things. It's not, I'm not saying you can't solve problems this way. But I'm not using, I'm not trying to start from the assumption that everything is written with code, first of all, frameworks. I'm saying, we'll use a resource-oriented way of thinking about problems. We'll think about the abstract resources as the first order problem. And then we can deliver them any way we like. So just to prove the, the scale, um, that's a, a snapshot of, of, a, of an older system. But you know, how, many, how, many micro, how many microservices are you running? You know, 10, 20, 100, 1,000? So this is my system. And how many, how many teams have you got managing those? This is my system. There's a resource that tells me, of course, because it's a resource-oriented system. So if I make a request for the module stats resource, this is my live system. I've got nearly 4,000 microservices. I've got 900 micro webs. I've got 200 modules in my system. So suddenly I'm a, at a different degree of scale in my systems. Um, how do I get back? When you step up in scale, even if you're doing microservices, you have to invent new tools. Because the regular way of thinking about software ain't going to work. You can't put a breakpoint on a microservice if the microservice is talking to two other microservices. It becomes very hard. You can't debug you know, multiple JVMs simultaneously if you're using Java. So what you need is you need to do what we do in the web. When we want to debug um, web applications, we need to be able to visualize the interactions of the resources and the requests into the resource space. So we use this tool in our browser called Firebug. Yeah, it lets me look at the requests, see what's going on. I can measure everything. I can see what the interactions are. I can see if bits of it fail. If we're building our software this way, we need the same kind of tool. So we have a tool called the Visualizer. And if I turn the visualizer on and, uh, oops, start the visualizer, make some requests. Um, let's look at a, a, a document or something. That's, that's what the system is. Um, actually, I'll show you that anyway. The, the system I'm showing you is microkernel architecture. We call it netkernel. And the only thing this thing knows about, it's a very small piece of code, it's about 100K. It only knows about requests, spaces, and endpoints. So it only knows about the abstraction, nothing else. 
I'll show you the caching implications in a moment, but we have essentially a, a foundation API. It's a little bit like a POSIX layer, so you don't have to inter interact with the core. And then above that, everything is a module. So it's a completely modular architecture because you can be completely modular because you've not got any coupling. Everything is late bound. It's a decoupled system. So you can evolve subsystems at will, arbitrarily. And then everything I'm showing you is, an is a resource-oriented application built on top of the modular tools and services available. So it's like Unix, right? In Unix, you, come, you get an operating system, you get a bunch of tools, and then other tools are built from those tools, and so on and so on. Let me turn off the visualizer. Stop it. And you see it's been recording what's going on, just like Firebug does. Um, let's go and look at that one. And we see that it doesn't matter what these identifiers are, but you can see there's a, a whole cascade of resource requests have happened in my system. Everything is a resource. Everything's being requested as a resource, just like Firebug, right? So I can do all of those things that I could do with an external system, but I'm now applying it at nano service scale. And of course, I can also measure everything because the measurement of the execution of any piece of code is state that we accumulate just because we're making resource requests. So I know that in this case, it took two milliseconds to do the whole stack of stuff, it took nothing to do most of it. And you'll see that, in fact, this is a consequence. Once we address everything as a resource, all of our software as a resource, suddenly we can hold on to stuff. So you can see there's a lot of cache hits. So that's places where I didn't have to run any code at all. I didn't plan that, it just caches everything. So we need new tools, we need tools like this. And if we're gonna carry on down the HTTP-based microservice route, we need similar tools across Docker containers and so on and so on. Because otherwise we can't make microservices and resources that interact with each other in a, in a way that allows us to keep our sanity. <coughs> so then a question comes up, yeah, but code is fast. Code has had 50 years of expert in, you know, design making sure that it's absolutely optimized the hell out of it. That's what JIT bytecode compilation does. That's what all the best linkers and compilers do. And you're adding an indirection every time. Two phases, just like web. That's insane, right? You wouldn't do that for software. You've got to, do, you've got to make it run fast. Well, when I started doing this, I was prepared to take the, the overhead. I thought, okay, if there's an overhead, what I still have got is a more evolvable architecture, a more, more better way of solving software problems. I'll take an overhead, because at least I'll be getting more economically valuable. But something very surprising started to happen, and that is things started to go faster. And there's two reasons why things started to go faster. The first reason if I go back in my slides a second. One of the tricks the web pulls to go faster is it recognizes that we're not trying to run code. We're trying to get a representation for state. So we don't care about that piece of code. We don't care about what box it's on. We don't care about what server it's on. And we call that load balancing. So we can put in one endpoint for this resource. If that resource becomes popular and hot, we can put in on demand as many endpoints as we need to satisfy the load. Because we're not trying to run code, we're trying to give representations. So that's why load balancing works. Well, guess what? We've now got tens of cores in our laptops now, order of magnitude. God knows how many on servers. They're just like, um, so we've got multi-core. So what we can do is we can think of these resource requests not as threaded scheduled threads, but logical resource requests. Can you please, as we do to the internet, can you please get me back a fair representation of this resource? However you do it, I don't care. So what we can do is exactly the same thing. We can load balance across multi-core without having to learn new esoteric languages. It just happens for free because that's what the web does. So suddenly all those cores that we have, that if we try and 
write low-level code to optimize the use of, we've now got a system that automatically optimizes the use of those cores. So we know that if I've got eight cores on my laptop and I move to a server with 16 cores, I'm going to get twice the throughput. And we see that because the granularity in which we're interacting with the code is fine, across the system as a whole, as an average, any small bottlenecks or so on, they average away. So the system behaves completely linearly. It scales completely linearly, no matter what really the system is. So this tool is a tool we provide. It's a linearity measurement tool. It's a resource. And it allows you to execute a, a representative load, a standard load on your software stack, or on, not on your software stack, but on your your stack, whatever it is, whether it's a Dockerized container or whether it's a you know to the metal operating system, and it allows you to say, is my full stack linear? If I don't see this ideal curve, one of my parts of my system is not behaving linearly, and you'd be very surprised. There are some very expensive, high-end um, cloud platforms. When you measure them for their linearity, give you extremely skewed nonlinear responses. The bottom line is you're paying, the, the harder you load these systems up, the more they throttle back and control your usage. So you're paying extra money for a high-end thing and you're not getting the return on it because your throughput is not running at the peak. So we can load balance for free across multi-core so we get more bang for our book from those great processes that we've all got. But then, because everything is a resource, we can do the trick that the web does. The web pulls this excellent trick of saying, if I've got a copy of it, and that copy's good enough, because we don't care about how current it is, as long as within the Nyquist sampling rate for this information from this Shannon system, this resource is valid enough, then I can give you it. So the, the web uses caching and time-based metrics to give you a good enough copy of the representational state. So we can do the same. Only we don't have to just rely on time to ensure we've got Nyquist concurrency and coherence. We can build a dependency-based model because we know that resource was dependent on those two resources, which depend on those four resources, which depend on the next six resources, and so on and so on and so on. So every resource we have, not only we can hold on to it, but we can also understand what its relationship is, what its context is to all the other things that it interacted with. So we can have dependency caching, which is a, a brand new thing. What that means is we can start to visualize where we're getting caching in our architectures. So this is a tool we call the cache heat map. So we, we don't just cache at a point in our architecture. We cache everything. We just say, we'll hold on to it. If someone comes along in a little while and still wants it as well, then we'll give you it from cache, as long as it's consistent with the dependency model. So what does our cache find? It finds that, yes, it's a very good idea to put a caching layer up close to your HTTP transport. Look, there's a hotspot. There's, in fact, there's three layers of hotspots in my architecture. I don't know what it is. I don't need to worry about it. It's not my decision. It's just discovering this is the distribution. It's also finding, if I show libraries, back here, there's another hotspot. In fact, you always end up with fan out, fan in, in these sorts of approach, because what you have is resources coming from here, which are common to other subsystems, which are then served out through a common front end, whatever it might be. But my systems decided that, hey, you know what? You're all piling out through this endpoint here to whatever it is, system of record, database, another microservice architecture, we don't know. I don't care. I can hold on to stuff there because you're all asking for the same thing. So there's a hot spot there as well. And then we would, might never guess that sitting right in the middle of my, what would we call middleware application, whatever that application subsystem is up there, some reason, there's a whole load of recomputed state there, or cacheable state there. Now, the thing about this diagram is not that we find hotspots. The thing about this diagram is 
we find color, i.e. regions of cacheable resources, everywhere, all through our software architectures. In the middle, at the front, at the back, sides, everywhere, all through. And um, I can't remember if I said it, but my background is I'm a physicist. So I, I look at this, and I see this system, and I go, I know what this is. This isn't a cache. This is a map of the thermodynamic energy surface of my computational system. That's what I'm looking at. Everywhere I see any color, if I was to write it with code, there would be a fixed cost to the energy of consumption to, to, calc to run that code. I've got to keep the CPU warm to do whatever it is. Anywhere I see some color, I'm doing a little bit less, perhaps a lot less, than I would if I linked it together as code. So I'm using less energy everywhere there's color. And it turns out, you use a lot less energy. Using less energy means going faster. Burning energy on a CPU is what costs you time. Not running a CPU is a very good thing when you can avoid it. So these systems not only scale linearly, but they also suddenly have this benefit of the abstraction allows us to discover what the computational energy surface and energy cost is of the system. And if there's any physicists in the audience, if I had time, I'd also explain that it also finds the entropy minima surface as well. So it starts to find the most well-structured information in the system as well as the most uh, low energy. So these things, if you want a headline from that, the cost of the abstraction, it turns out anyway is negligible. You know, even if you do end up missing the cache and missing so on, it's a nanosecond in a millisecond or greater cost, right? It's really nothing. So the abstraction costs you nothing anyway, but once you use the abstraction, suddenly you get enormous payback. But it shouldn't be a big surprise because these are the tricks the web pulls, right, to make the web work. If the web wasn't doing it the same thing, it wouldn't be able to work. Google couldn't work if it didn't do the same ideas. Uh, no time to show this, but, uh, oh, I can. There's a composite resource. Um, and we often end up building composite resources, like I said. And if I request that, uh, you see nothing changes. Um, and I said it's a dependency-based model. We can depend on, obviously, physical resources like code and scripts and files and so on. But it turns out you can also do this sort of uh, engineering trick, which is we can solve complex problems like cache consistency and coherence by inventing imaginary resources. Okay? So I can say my composite resource depends on obviously all the physical files that it's been, that's been necessary to, to, to run the code and whatever it is that built it. But when I build it, I can also say this also, let's imagine that it depends upon X and Y and Z. Okay? So what I can do is then, if I want my system to be coherent, say I change the database that's got um, whatever's creating resource one, I can go in and cut the, the virtual resource. So if I cut re virtual resource all, uh, virtual resource all, odd, which all the odd resources depended on, and I go back and I look at my composite resource, all the odd resources obviously can't be served from cache anymore because they're one of their dependencies, it's virtual, but it's a dependency, isn't valid, so we have to recompute that sub-resource. And what it turns out is the, real, the reason caching works isn't because we're, we're holding on to values, that's what caching is. The reason caching works is because the world, that thing out there, comes at us with you know, uniform distributions, statistically uh, measurable requests. So there's a resource for this room, okay? The resource is how many people, you know, what are, who are the people in this room listening to this talk? Now, fortunately, I haven't seen anybody walk out, so the resource that we could have measured at the start of the talk, what's the people in the room, is still valid. It's only if someone leaves the room where we could cut the virtual resource that says they've gone. 
Now we'll recalculate who the people in the room are. We can do that all the way through our software architectures. And we can take that kind of control. We're not relying, like we do in the web, on Nyquist sampling rates. All we can do in the web to take control of cacheability is say, don't come back until Tuesday. That's okay if it's not going to change till Tuesday. But if it suddenly becomes critical that it's changed, you can't flush Akamai's cache on an individual basis. Okay. I'm running well out of time, I think. Yeah. There's loads and loads of implications of this. It turns out that problems that we typically think are quite complicated, like multi-party interactions, suddenly become relatively simple. I could show you the implications on security of doing this and how you can introduce security layers. I can, sh I can show you that if you've worked out a generalization of the web architecture and web abstraction, it doesn't take um, much uh, persuasion for you to say, well, you know what? We could make a protocol for that, couldn't we? We don't have to use HTTP. We could make this resource-oriented approach, this uniform resource-oriented approach, distributed. So we could have it on any one of our nodes in our, in our cluster. And I could interact with the spaces as though it was local. Because we're using a resource-oriented abstraction that is neutral in terms of its protocol. It's the abstraction. It's not, the, it's not embodied in the mechanism in the network. So I can, I can abstract it across any transport. I could show you that. What I'll do is just, I think this, this came up yesterday. I was hearing that um, what's happening in the future? There was the question came up, I think, somewhere in one of the tracks. And I think one of the answers was there's going to be a lot more software developed. The problem with software is it's precise, precision material because we are trusted to touch this amazingly powerful thing called a Turing machine and encode um, programmatic sequences onto the Turing machine. That's why we call it coding. We're encoding a program onto the tape. We can't allow just any old person to encode the Turing machine. What we need to do is to say, let's keep the full power, the full fat power of the Turing machine away, but let's not stop software at that level. What we need to be able to do is say, let's not write code. Let's allow people, because I could talk to the CEO of my organization, and the CEO would recognize the resource, the people in the room. We can talk about it. I can give him an endpoint that provides the people in the room, or whatever the heck he's interested in, sales in this region, or whatever it is he's interested in. And I could say to him, yeah, you're safe to ask for that resource, because you're not going to do any damage. It's a resource. You're not running. You're not making code. You're asking for a resource. So what I can do is I can start to build tools around resource composition. But it's still software. It's just not full fat software. We've, make, we've made it safe. We've made it a playground that even idiot CEOs can use. So this is something we call ENCODE. Don't take this, you write software in NetKernel this way. You can use any language you like. It's Java-based. You can use Ruby and Python and Groovy. And we're like Unix. We don't care what language it's in. But the JVM, the Java, is its kind of like home language, just like C is the home language to Unix. So this is just a language. But it's a visual language. And I'll show you a quick demo. So oh, this is a game, right? So you take the CTO or CEO and say, the game is, see that response thing there? You've got to turn it from being red. That's all you've got to do. So that's one solution. And if I, um, if I go to that link there, what I get is that crappy piece of XML. This is especially for Ron, who loves XML so much. But tell the CTO, hey, that XML, you can make it pretty. Look, I've got this thing called HTML table. You don't have to know what it does. But look, 
join that piece of XML to that HTML table, join the HTML table to the response, and then what have we got? Oh, that's nicer. I like that. Yes, that's good. They can do that themselves. You don't have to write that for them. You just give them a palette of simple things. We're composing nanoservices. So, oh, well, that's okay. Um, you get the idea. And obviously what I can do is I can add endpoints just visually. There's a new endpoint. There's its grammar. There's its declaration. There's all the stuff to do with it. Um, it's not connected. So what I've got here is a little party trick just for the fun of it. And my party trick has the obligatory hello world. And there it is, the hello world resource. That's pretty rubbish. So instead of that, let's put that component in there. And then I reload it. Oops. Have I saved it? Turned it into a QR code. If you want a QR code, hello world, there it is, put your phone on there. But that's pretty rubbish. So why don't I connect this thing to the output? And what's that doing for me? That's giving me, oh, that's giving me the time. And notice I can click and click and click, but it's got a one second cache expiry function associated with it. So it's valid as many times as I like, but it changes itself automatically every second. So I can keep requesting it, and it only ticks once a second. So that looks a bit like a clock. So, what have I got myself now? There's a QR code clock. Not very much use, but there you go. Point your phone at it. There you go, QR code clock. So, summary. Thank you for listening to me. This wasn't about technology. I'm, I'm a physicist. I was affronted by the wastefulness and insanity of building stuff and investing all our mental energy into solving difficult things and then being prepared to just throw it away. And then I looked at the web and I went, well, the web doesn't seem to do that. So this was my answer to what would happen if we took that idea really seriously and we just ran with it. We just kept going and going and going and going until we've got... The other thing, I, it's a good job I'm a physicist, right? Because physicists have this um, neurotic disease. They cannot stand special things, special cases. Okay? My neurotic compulsion is I had to come up with a general solution. It wasn't good enough to just have you know, a framework. Framework's a special thing. This is a general abstraction. You could apply it to any problem. What do you get when you build stuff this way? What's Netcom provide? Well, you get complete hot swappable architecture. You can roll forward and roll back instantaneously with no downtime. In fact, uh, with comp you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, we aim never ever to turn the software off. It's, it's there, you deploy changes to it, and the changes are you know, there and you can take them away. You get legacy coexistence. Legacy coexistence is such a fundamental requirement of good architecture. Because something that's providing a valid resource shouldn't be ever thrown away, unless somehow the organization no longer values that resource. So keep things there. Why, why change everything? If it's good for this today and it's good tomorrow, we don't need to rewrite it ever. So things need to last for much longer. I've got software that is 10 years old that I never have to worry about because it still does what I wanted it to do 10 years ago. But it mixes with new stuff because it's not coding, it's resources. You get genuine reuse. So we don't reuse code because its intent and its usefulness is well worthy and we model things as best we can. That model and what it does somehow gets lost in the noise and complexity of the linking and the system that we put it into and we can't remember what it was for and it just gets lost it's just lost in the noise well if everything's a resource we can do things like 
search and aggregation, aggregation patterns like the web does. The web allows us to deal with the noise of millions and billions of endpoints by using these things called search that allows us to filter the noise out to find out what's useful. So I can search my micro nano services and find things that might be useful to me. And if I've been a diligent developer and I've left a nice little document, a man page associated with that resource as well, I can look at it and go, oh, that's good. I found this thing. It's just, just what I was looking for. I don't have to write that. So you start to get real reuse. And it's, you know, it's, it's not because object-oriented can't be reused. It's just it's, it's a hard thing to reuse. The material is difficult to reuse. You know? um, and it scales and evolves and so on and so on. And as I said, I could have spent the whole afternoon showing you a whole load of other demos and things. It really works. We run um, really, so I, I'm a, uh, I keep getting told I've got to get out more because I'm by, by nature just an engineer. I like to just build things. I'm a plumber, basically, information plumber. And we do plumbing for hardcore stuff. So we run telecoms systems. We run most of Belgium's, uh, sorry, Holland's telecom systems. So anybody from Holland, your telephone runs on this stuff thousands of microservices. And it has been doing for 12 years, just day in, day out. We run huge Black Friday retail sites on the heaviest day of traffic there is on the internet. 20, 50, 100,000 requests per instance. We run big dot .com platforms. The thing I'm probably most proud of is this idea of taking the web and really understanding it was a, a seed of an idea a long time ago. But now there's parts of the web infrastructure, like anyone heard of Dublin Core metadata? Anyone heard of the persistent URL service? Semantic web technologies rely on this dependable indirection layer in, in the web architecture for consistency. That whole platform runs on, on NetKernel. So it's powering a, an, an important subsystem in the web. And we run linked data platforms and you name it. Uh, it's open source, it's dual license, so you can pay me if you want to use it for, you know, to use really high-end fancy stuff. I'm perfectly happy to accept money. I'm not, not proud, but you can use it for free, of course. And um, we've been around for a long time, but we've been very patient because we've been basically saying, <clears throat> you know, soap is shit. You can see it's shit because web services was built by people who didn't understand the web. So it was inevitable that it was going to be a pile of cack. REST is great because it really does understand the web. But the, you know, the, the thing I'm saying to you is that's heresy because there's a lot of religious um, believers about the right way to do REST is you know what? REST isn't quite right. The abstraction of that REST embodies, the difference between put and post, it's not a fully consistent resource-oriented model. But it's great because it goes through firewalls and everybody knows how to use it. So I'm not dismissing it as a, as a very good transport and protocol, but it's not the end game. It's not finished. So get in touch, play with it. Don't expect to be able to learn it in a day because you have to, first of all, someone who's a regular developer who picks up this has to learn most fundamentally that it's just like the web. It's not gonna, you're making connections between logical systems that only you can verify by probing and making a request and proving to yourself that the change you made is the change that's happening. Once you've established it, just like you do with a web endpoint, it's going to do it till the cows come home forever. So ch when you change a system like that, you have to be, when you start, you have to be very <laughs> diligent because the, the tendency is to make three changes and test at the end of three changes, and you might find that it was the one in the middle that screwed it, and then it's hard to debug. But it's no different to the web. It's not difficult, it's just different. You have to use slightly different mindset to deal with it. But it turns out that 
I, the way I see it, I used to talk about this as like moving to having kind of fun composing stuff up. And it's kind of the same fun as doing Lego, you know, building composed stuff out of the building blocks. It's a very similar feeling. But that's really old hat. It's more like doing Minecraft, okay? Where you can make your own blocks. That's it. So hopefully it made sense. Thank you.